Good morning, uh, everybody. My name's Nick Hillman. I'm director of HEPI, the Higher Education Policy Institute, which is an independent think tank based in Oxford, where I'm talking to you from today. And uh, welcome to this webinar, which we are hosting with the University of Bristol. Uh, and it's particularly focused on a report that we published in the summer, which you can find on our website. We'll put the link uh, in the chat by Nicola Dandridge, who is a professor now at the University of Bristol and was formerly chief executive, first ever chief executive of the Office for Students, chief executive previously of Universities UK and has done lots of other uh, important roles uh, in our sector too. So first this morning, we're gonna hear from Nicola and then I'm going to turn to our respondents um, in the following uh, order. First, we're gonna, uh, after Nicola, hear from Martha. Martha Longdon, uh, who is Faculty Education and Student Experience Manager for Social Sciences at the University of Nottingham. She was previously a board member uh, at the Office for Students and chair of the Office for Students student panel. So many of you may have uh, heard uh, um, her speak before. Um, and she's always very interesting. Uh, and she, she did that for four years. And she's currently studying a PhD for a PhD in higher education at Lancaster University. Uh, and some time ago now, she was president of Nottingham Trent uh, University Students' Union. Um, then we will hear from Professor Tanzi Jessup, who is PVC, Pro Vice Chancellor for Education and Students uh, at our partner institution for today, uh, the University of Bristol. Um, and Tanzi was previously Professor of Research Informed Teaching, so uh, very relevant, Professor of Research Informed Teaching at uh, Solent University in Southampton and Head of Learning and Teaching uh, before that at the University of Winchester. Um, and Tansy was awarded a National Teaching Fellowship uh, in 2016 for her work uh, and her creative approach to teaching uh, in HE. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, we'll hear from Sir David Bell, who uh, ha has done many roles, including uh, Vice Chancellor of the University of Reading and is currently Vice Chancellor of the University of Sunderland, where he's been for five years. Uh, and before those jobs, uh, he was Permanent Secretary at the Department for Education in Whitehall. And uh, before that, uh, also did many other uh, jobs in education, including uh, Chief Inspector of Schools and once upon a time was a, was a classroom teacher as well, I think, David, uh, early in your career. Um, so with no, uh, j just a couple of housekeeping rules, it's all on the record. Please do keep questions coming in thick and fast in the Q&A, uh, because we will put those questions to the panel after they've all spoken. Please do upvote other people's questions, because we will look to take the most popular uh, questions. We will, as we always do at Happy Webinars, uh, ask you to ask your own question, which means we'll turn on your microphone and you can put it yourself in your own words to the panel. If you don't want to do that, you can always uh, pose the question anonymously and then I, I will read it. Uh, I will read it out. If you have any tech problems, um, keep them for the chat and we'll do our best to uh, tackle those. Um, but with no uh, further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Professor, uh, Professor, sorry, Professor Nicola Dandridge uh, from the University of Bristol and author of the HEPI report that I just mentioned. Over to you, Nicola. Thanks, Nick. And um, morning, everyone. Uh, the, the relationship between teaching research, which is the subject of this, uh, the HEPI booklet that we're discussing this morning is something that has interested me for many years. And it is, of course, absolutely fundamental to what uh, universities do in different ways. Uh, yet it seems to me that in many ways the relationship is uncertain and ill-defined, certainly at national level. And to some extent, it is contested. And this issue particularly came to the fore at national level in England in 2015 during the discussions that led to the introduction of the teaching excellence framework which as you know was trying to uh, rebalance internal university focus on teaching as much as on research and then it emerged again um, at national level and in England um, primarily in 2016 in the context of the passage of the higher education and research bill which as you know proposed splitting off the teaching and research functions of HEFKE um, and um, separating it out into Office of the Students and UKRI and Research England. 
And during those debates leading up to the Higher Education Research Act, there were some very compelling arguments, I thought, for separating out the two functions at national level, particularly in terms of transparency of funding and accountability and regulatory oversight and so on. And also a strong sense that actually is a pattern over the years that many politicians, at least, were sceptical um, about the value of the relationship. Um, perhaps reflecting their view that uh, the relationship was sometimes invoked in a way that disguised um, a proper focus on teaching quality. Um, but at the same time, there were concerns expressed by many in the sector who were worried about the consequences of the split at national level and how that would impact on universities' work. Um, but for reasons that perhaps we can discuss, the arguments um, advanced at the time in favour of keeping the two functions together at national level were were not that compelling in my view. And I you know, was very much part of that debate. So this is no criticism at all. Um, and of course, as we know, the, the two functions ended up being separated. And I remember at the time um, looking at the academic literature on the relationship between teaching and research and noting both um, how extensive and authoritative and thoughtful it was, but also that it seemed to focus very much on the ways that universities could and should uh, construct a relationship between teaching and research for pedagogical purposes and there was far less either on why that relationship should exist both nationally and at the level of universities um, but also um, the extent to which a separation at national level does or does not impact on what um, universities do. So fast forward a few years and when I joined University of Bristol this time last year, actually, I was very keen to explore this issue in more detail. It seems to be really important, really fundamental with all sorts of consequences. And I was keen also myself to try and better understand uh, the nature of the relationship and why, if at all, it mattered and in particular what the impact was on students. And I should say, by the way, a rather obvious point, my, my um, focus is very much on policy. I'm not an academic. And so I've been looking at this issue through the lens, through policy eyes, not through pedagogical or academic eyes. So as I set out in the Happy Book booklet, um, we've got this volume of authoritative, compelling academic literature, which is largely pedagogical and primarily looking at how um, research can inform teaching and the different ways of doing that. Um, and then, uh, on the other hand, we've got this whole question of the re university reputation, which hinges so much on research and research performance, um, enhanced by the impact of global, global league tables, which primarily reflect um, research performance and research reputation, and um, which then get used, particularly by international students, as proxies for teaching quality. And then in practice, um, we see the growing separation of teaching and research functions within universities, um, primarily um, reflecting the um, es essential, important expansion of student numbers, particularly in certain subjects, um, associated with um, an increasing number of teaching only contracts within universities. And then we see separate committee structures under Vice Chancellor's Education and Research, and then the split reinforced by separate regulatory and funding arrangements. And then in terms of government policy, um, Labour and Conservative alike, actually, over the years, have implemented policies which have uh, directly or indirectly led to separation at national level, um, underpinned by this scepticism about the value of the relationship. And then more recently, we've got separate um, ministers and departments. Now, my point about all of this, as I hope was clear in the booklet, is not to argue that separation at national level of teaching and research funding and oversight is a good or a bad thing. I mean, personally, as you'd expect from someone who was involved in setting up the office of students, I think the um, clarity that you get from a separate focus on each of teaching and research is really important, but that, that's not my point. My point is more that we need to understand the relationship better at both institutional and national level and the impact that it has. And as I said in the HEPI booklet, this is, this is so we can promote and enhance the advantages of separation and also critically mitigate any disadvantages. But unless we know what the advantages and disadvantages are, we clearly can't do either. So in the booklet, I identify six broad areas um, after running through some of the issues that I've just described. Um, I identify six areas where in my view, um, the issue might matter and we don't have time I'm not going to go through them all now but I'm just going to pick out two. Um, first I think the lack of clarity about the relationship might not be that helpful to students and this manifests itself in different ways 
and for example a lack of transparency about what the what benefits do accrue to students um, from studying in a research environment environment um, may mean that we allow um, research reputation to distort a proper focus on teaching, as I mentioned before. And it can also obscure the fact that research activity can um, draw, draw resource and focus away from teaching and student support. And that uh, clearly matters. But on the other hand, if we're not clear about the relationship and we allow these two functions to separate, it may mean that students end up not being exposed to research activity. And that may well lead to, uh, depending on discipline, depending on university mission, but it may lead to an impoverishment of the student's experience. And we need to understand when and how that happens and what the implications are. Um, and, and at the very least, it may also lead to some students more likely from disadvantaged backgrounds um, not considering research careers. And the second reason why I think it matters um, is that separation may not be helpful in supporting broader uh, social, economic and political objectives that rely on both teaching and research in a quite in integrated way. So industry, businesses need often both research and teaching. Um, and the development of professionally and industrially focused and engaged curricula for undergraduate students. Um, and that will benefit from close exposure to industry R&D. And that's harder to secure if the two are carried out separately or in separate institutions. Um, and if um, government responsibility is split between departments and now between ministers, it can end up pushing strategy and policy at national level in different directions that can undermine each other rather than harnessing them in a strategic and coordinated way. And um, for example, in relation to a regional economic and cultural regeneration in cold spot areas, there is real value in having coordination between R&D investment and investment in higher level skills priorities. Now, of course, those things can happen if there is separation, but it just needs more managing, it needs more focus, and it needs, I think, more policy join up. And in the booklet, I contrast that actually with the um, National Science Foundation in the States, where, um, I mean, I'm not closely familiar with it, so I don't know what actual impact it has, but nonetheless, research grants are premised on a requirement for investment in workforce development. And that seems to me to enable strategic coordination in a way that our model perhaps doesn't. Anyway, I want to finish um, by mentioning the work that I'm now just concluding, actually, to follow, following on from the HEPI paper, where um, I have been interviewing um, over 30 vice chancellors, provosts, pro vice chancellors for education and research, and a few student leaders as well from across the United Kingdom, asking for their views on how they understand the relationship between teaching and research and its impact. And I'm hoping it's going to lead to a published paper. And their views are completely fascinating and insightful. And it's been an incredible privilege and pleasure talking with leaders from across the sector who spent years thinking about these same issues um, within their institutions. And one of the many fascinating themes that's emerging from those interviews is the need for more consideration as to how the relationship between teaching and research impacts on academic staff and the pressures that many staff feel um, being pulled in both directions, the challenges of, for them of managing teaching research and also for the, for the leadership of institutions managing those two activities and the way that so often research seems to trump teaching in terms of internal university priorities. And the HR and OD aspects of the relationship is something that I touched on very briefly in the HEPI paper, but I think it's a huge and important issue in its own right, and it deserves more focus and intention. Um, but look, there are so many elements to this question of the relationship. So at this point, um, I'm gonna stop speaking and hand over to uh, my other panel members, and we'll of course very much look forward to hearing their perspectives and also hearing from you with your views and questions uh, it shortly. Thank you so much, uh, Nicola. I think you've uh, introduced that so neatly. And I think you've proven, as your pamphlet does, that it's a sort of more nuanced, more complex, less clear cut issue, perhaps, than many of those that we certainly are happy write about. And are happy we do try to cover both the teaching and learning functions of university and the research functions and indeed all the other uh, all the other functions. And when we took Nicola's paper through our peer review process, um, which we do for all our full length publications, I've got to say the conversation we had was probably richer than on just about any other draft paper. So um, that was why we thought it was so important to have a webinar where we could um, really expose 
some of these arguments and, and hear other voices as well uh, on the back of Nicola's paper. So I'm delighted now to turn to Martha, Martha Longdon, um, uh, who, uh, great, uh, there you are, Martha, over to you. Brilliant, thank you, Nick. So I think Nicola's really set out um, the context of the piece um, incredibly well, and I, I, I hope it comes as no surprise as a uh, PhD student, as someone who's currently working in student experience in a university uh, and as a former student rep, that I'm, I'm going to try and take this kind of down to the within provider level and looking at what that relationship kind of currently might mean and what it could mean in the future um, for teaching for student experience. So I'm sure many of you will know that for many institutions, um, the, the freezing of home student fees um, has had a huge impact on um, teaching and research activity within universities. Often the home student fees fall short of covering the costs um, associated with providing a really high quality education. This has led to many universities increasing their recruitment of um, international and postgraduate taught students, and in my opinion, often uh, actually over recruiting um, from those cohorts as well. Um, and this is in part because those fees are uncapped and it helps to generate a small surplus to be um, reinvested in activity elsewhere uh, within the university. Research reputation is a really attractive recruitment tool for those markets, particularly internationally, um, whether that's a standalone metric or via the league tables that take, in the, uh, take research activity into account. It also helps to recruit uh, excellent academics um, from around the world who form part of the teaching staff, uh, sometimes very enthusiastically, sometimes uh, slightly reluctantly, and, and unfortunately sometimes without the proper support to be able to develop their teaching practice um, to the best of their ability as well. This means in practice that the surplus generated is channeled, often channeled into furthering research activity, perpetuating a cycle where the student's teaching and learning experience becomes secondary. And the teaching excellence framework, or the TEF, uh, is an attempt to address that issue, and it's certainly, I think, in my opinion, made some strides in helping to recognise and reward institutions that excel in teaching. Uh, but it's clear that more profound change is needed in funding and policy to ensure that teaching is prioritised and that the UK is able to maintain its reputation uh, for really high quality degrees and a high quality student experience. Uh, we need to ensure that the pedagogy is adequately supported. Um, but we also need to find ways to develop better research informed teaching practice uh, to find a better, better, better balance um, in that relationship. And for this purpose, I'd like to take the really broad definition of research informed teaching to include those providers who don't have their own uh, research activity but could benefit from uh, activity of others. Providers are increasingly good at forging partnerships with local employers and bringing them into learning spaces uh, with students with activities like live briefs and consultancy challenges, which allow students to apply theory from their degrees to a practical real world example. But I think that universities could be better at replicating these types of activities with live research, whether that's research conducted within their own institution or beyond. There are some really good examples of this. Um, the ones that I've personally seen have been generally within STEM, um, but I'm sure it applies to other disciplines as well. And they're often led by um, either PGRs or very early career lecturers who are just really excited to share their current projects. And through this, students get to hear about innovative ideas, cutting edge technology, and learn more about what's involved in research. And also who's doing that research. You know, that research can look like really anybody. Um, and it's more about your kind of ideas and your willingness to persevere. This could be better embedded in curriculum though, uh, and delivered much more consistently. It's often worth saying as well that universities could, could usually also draw more effectively on research expertise uh, within their providers to design and evaluate their pedagogy um, and to look at the wider experience within the university as well. Often in teaching and learning, students get to practice and develop elements of research, but these tend to be more about the technical competencies and learning to learn. So in biosciences, that could look like running PCRs uh, to look for genetic variation. In psychology, perhaps things like a Stroop test, um, these are really more about developing skills in reproducibility and replicating research, and they're usually very safe experiments. And I don't mean that necessarily in a health and safety sort of a way, but in that they're chasing answers that are already known. And this reflects often the typical power dynamic in the classroom as well, where students see the title of doctor, for example, and assume that means their academic knows everything there is to know about the subject. And this can actually inhibit their engagement if they haven't built that confidence yet to have those conversations and to kind of perhaps test out ideas and theories. And whilst the academic will undoubtedly have a wealth of experience, it may be more focused on certain topics with occasional gaps in others. And I think most lecturers tend to have at least one or two slides in their lecture content that they secretly hope students will never ever ask them about. But the title of doctor also means that if, um, if they're like most PhD students, 
at some point they've had to throw their hands up and say, do you know, I have absolutely no idea what this is or why it's doing that. But they've also, importantly, had the perseverance to carry on and find the answers. And those are the types of skills we need to be instilling in our graduates, whether they're planning to pursue research or not. The ability to work with uncertainty, and it's worth remembering that many of our current um, undergraduate students in particular have been through periods of immense uncertainty over the past few years. Um, this is about learning to work with that effectively and to be able to find a pathway through it, to iterate through failure and to understand the limits of their own experience and the expertise of others. Some of the best discussions I've ever had, which have shaped both my research and professional practice, have been in research groups where we've talked really openly about this, about all of these things, um, and been really honest when we don't have a clue. Uh, we've created a really non-judgmental environment to be wrong and to fail and to pick ourselves back up again. And these are the skills which are vital for academic and professional success. So whilst we don't have the power necessarily to change policy and funding at a national level, at least in the short term, um, there is a lot that universities uh, can do to help them balance teaching research effectively and to make the most of that relationship um, and to maintain their research excellence, develop teaching excellence and to provide a really high quality student experience uh, with very well prepared graduates in the process. I'm going to leave it there. Fantastic, thank you so much uh, Martha. There's a lot of, I'd like to ask you about that but I'm going to move straight on to Tansy so we've got lots of time for Q&A afterwards. Do keep the questions coming in. There's some great ones in the chat already. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. And uh, great to follow Nicola and Martha. I love the, um, the idea of uncertainty that came up in Martha's talk. And of course, Nicola, I think your booklet gives us a very high level policy analysis of the research teaching relationship, which you know ranges from Humboldt in 1810 and looking at the, the, the origin of ideas about a community of scholarship uh, right to the 21st century, where we've got the REF and the TEF and the separation of departments in the UK. What I want to focus on today is your, your question, Nicola, which is uh, why it matters, who it matters for, and what it might look like to have stronger research teaching links. So I've kind of structured my talk by looking at the characteristics that um, can occur when you have strong research teaching links in our students and in our community of scholars. And then I've kind of moved off to just have a little think about context. Um, you talk about a diversity of providers and obviously my history at Winchester Solent and then Bristol gives a bit of a range that I wanna to speak to how research informed teaching looks in those different contexts brief briefly. Then I wanna draw out a couple of common threads from those contexts and um, respond to the challenges of how we secure a clearer definition of research uh, and teaching links across the sector so that we can advance on that. So in terms of characteristics, when I, I think about um, uh, the characteristics research and teaching links bring out in our students, it really goes to the heart of the purpose of higher education, which for me is about students making a difference in society um, and students not following easy and scholarly populist narratives, uh, but thinking deeply about the, the, the nature of knowledge society and the world uh, and their contribution to it. So it's what Kathleen Quinlan describes as epistemic virtues. And for me, those are about students developing a moral ethical approach to knowledge generation where critical thinking, fact checking, robust evaluation, of um, knowledge in context takes place, and particularly in a context of social media and uh, generative AI. I think you mentioned it, Martha, there's something about uh, research breeding habits of persistence, but also playfulness with ideas, the ability to tolerate ambiguity. I think fundamentally research and teaching links are about the framing of questions rather than jumping to conclusions and answers. And that framing of questions really affects the pedagogy and how, how we teach. Um, I think there's another dimension to um, research teaching links, which is understated, um, which is really that in order for students to grow in confidence about their ideas, they need to follow hunches and their intuition. I, I love the way, Martha, you spoke about originality and that students mustn't be following a recipe in a power dynamic where they replicate other people's ideas. There's something about all of us 
um, using some of that tacit knowledge and intuition to, to push out a bit and take a few risks that's important in research. So for me, it's about a characteristic of a research and teaching link is about developing in students confidence and intellectual humility uh, and helping them to be comfortable without knowledge of all the facts, uh, which you know periods of uncertainty certainly foster. And I think ultimately it's about students being authors of knowledge and agents of uh, their learning. So how, does the, how do these come about? Context really matters. I'll give you a quick snapshot. When I was at Winchester, it was the period that uh, Nicola references in her book booklet uh, in the mid noughties where the government decided uh, to distribute um, research informed teaching funding small pots in inverse proportion to QR funded universities. So universities who didn't do a lot of research uh, and didn't get a lot of QR funding got this, fund, this uh, RIT money for three years. It was a massive catalyst for a place like Winchester and really triggered a lot of student engagement work, student journals, and was the genesis of our student fellows scheme, which is spread across a lot of universities in the sector, including Bristol, where students do research on educational areas or areas relevant to education with academics. So small parts of funding is a common thread that works. And the second university I was at has a long history and tradition, Solent, of challenging the nostrum that you can only do research informed teaching in universities where you've got lots of research, active researchers and big laboratories and loads of QR funding. And I was appointed there as a professor of research informed teaching long after Roger Brown was involved in the select committee in 2009 as a vice chancellor, chancellor of Solent and said, actually, research, research matters for teaching as much as for the economy and industry. Uh, it creates a pipeline for society. So in the ro role at Solent, the manifestations of research and teaching links were largely around um, an outward focus, taking our students to the British Conference for Undergraduate Research, getting them to present at posters in Parliament and at the British Conference for Undergraduate Research. This had a backwash effect on curriculum. I, I note that Warwick held the 11th or 12th or 13th British Conference for Undergraduate Research last year. This initially was a national teaching fellowship project, which now has 650 delegates attending from loads of different universities across the world, presenting their conference findings in an authentic research setting. So really exciting what was going on at Solent. And it birthed a curriculum framework which spoke to intuition and research and lots of different methods of doing research and for teaching. Bristol is, you know, one of the top five research intensive universities in the UK. It is awash with research active researchers. And what we've done centrally to define and clarify what that means is in, in Nicola's re re report, she speaks about exposure to researchers. And there's something about exposure to researchers that needs also to be a bit more intentional. And I think some of that intentionality has been in co-publishing. So in our latest TEF submission, we said that in the last four years, having found this out, uh, and we saw that there were 275 co-published articles by academics and uh, students at Bristol. We also um, have run through a student fellow scheme, a research journal, research conference, which brings that together. So what are um, the common threads if one looks at you know, and just one other thing about Bristol, obviously, we have a promotion framework which joins up research and teaching quite neatly. It's not perfect, but it's moving in the right direction. And we've got 20% of our students moving on to postgraduate study. So there's something there that is beginning to emerge as a strong narrative at Bristol. For me, the common threads about research and teaching are about a clarity of vision about student engagement, student participation, and student agency in the curriculum in different contexts in doing research from day one, not having a facts first approach, but enabling students to do some sort of curious discovery learning and frame questions from early on in their degrees. I think that vivifies 
the educational experience. I think it's what lots of people talk about now is authentic learning. And it widens the definition of research from pure research to applied, professional, clinical, other forms of research. So finally, having looked at common threads briefly, I just want to talk about how we create a more enabling environment for research and teaching links. I, I think in the mid 2000s, small pots of funding were a real boost. But you know, sadly, they only lasted three years, and we know that the funding pots are broadly empty. Um, I think 2009, in my view, was the last time, or you know, I'm, I'm reading from Nicola's report, that we had any serious um, government academic discussion in a select committee about research and teaching links. That seems a long time ago. A lot's happened, and I think what's happened is that uh, research and teaching links have become contextualized, localized. Um, uh, manifestations that are not brought together in a national discussion, which Nicola's paper begins to do. So I think we need to revive this conversation. For me, today's a start. Um, and then I think there's a, there's a question really, should mission groups be thinking about taking this forward and speaking to one another about it? And could we use REF and TEF more intelligently as levers to make research and teaching links clearer and define them more clearly in the kinds of uh, requirements we make. We know that TEF speaks lots of, about TEF submissions are rich in research informed teaching and information, but REF has very marginal commentary on the joins between the two. Uh, it leads one to think that um, there's something about measuring and uh, valuing what we measure rather than measuring what we value. And I think this conversation begins a thread round Shouldn't we be measuring more what we value and investing in it and, and talking together more to define more clearly why research informed teaching matters? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tansy. Um, I've never seen so many questions come in thick and fast. So um, um, I'm going to turn very quickly to David to hear David's comments. David, as well as all those other illustrious roles he's uh, performed, is also a happy, long-standing happy trustee. So um, over to you, David. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, and thanks as well to Martha and Tanzi for thoughtful and stimulating responses to Nicola's excellent paper. Nicola refers to the Robbins Report, a subject of much debate on the HEPI blogosphere recently, and the, the references to the interface between teaching and research even then remind us that this is not a new issue. But, but even today, I think we can say there is no ideal balance between teaching and research in UK higher education because it consists of many varied and autonomous institutions who will seek to work this out for themselves. So to use a bit of jargon, research intensives are likely to have a different approach to institutions like my own, which may by comparison describe themselves as research active and or research informed. And of course, there's an almost infinite variety in between if we think of this as a continuum. Even then, institutions which may in income anyway be more orientated towards teaching will rightly still prize and value scholarship and research to inform educational practice. And we mustn't forget that that's a very important component, even when we are thinking about education work in universities. In every university, and I think Nicola touches on this well, leaders understand the extent to which undertaking research is part of academic identity, uh, both at an institutional level and at the level of the uh, individual academic. Indeed, I'd go further and say that uh, institutional leaders ignore that at their peril. But, but there are tensions to be managed, and Nicola properly highlights a number of them, including the move to more teaching-only contracts, which was to a large extent a response to drivers at the national level, not least uh, in relation to REF classifications of staff. I also think that Nicola identifies some quite uh, powerful contradictions in what universities say and do. For example, they make a virtue out of less teaching time as a benefit to researchers in some areas, while in others, praying in aid 
the link between research and teaching. I, I, I am to some extent too skeptical about uh, the extent to which students, particularly when coming to university in the first place, are terribly concerned about the detail of research, generally or specifically. But I think Nicola is right to suggest that research, and probably an ill-defined way, contributes to academic reputation, certainly in league table terms, uh, and that influences students and their decisions. So Nick, to help stimulate the conversation to follow, I pose four quick questions. First, why did so many modern universities, in the main, the ex-polytechnics, feel that if they were to build reputation, it was all about becoming more research intensive? Did anyone ever move from being a, a, a research intensive uh, to being teaching intensive? You know the answer to that. And I think that's a very significant tell about how the sector really feels about research as opposed to teaching. And maybe it's best captured in Nicola's words when she talks about the power of research prestige, which has a distorting influence. Secondly, and obviously related, is the elephant in the room not one of status and prestige? Put starkly, is teaching for all the efforts put into enhancing its importance still seen in the minds of many academics as a lesser form of activity than research? Now, if it is, be careful what you wish for, because as Nicola says, it is not entirely fanciful to imagine a future where most teaching and research are carried out separately. For me, that would be a highly deleterious move, but it is not beyond the bounds of possibility, and we might want to discuss how best to avoid it. Third, have we as a sector, and perhaps not for the first time either, been cloth-eared when it comes to legitimate public and political concern that we do not give enough attention to teaching. To put it a different way, the recent industrial action universities doesn't damage our reputation because politicians think that not enough research has been done. It damages us because there is a perception that we don't care enough about teaching and students learning. Fourth, even if you accept that research and teaching need different accountability mechanisms, REF and TEF, does that necessarily require two separate regulators and two separate government departments to be involved? Um, I, I was interested that Nicola actually opened her remarks with that point. And uh, to quote the pamphlet, political assurances about strategic alignment between teaching and research have not translated into practice. If that is true, then surely the machinery of government is not an irrelevant consideration in this debate. Back to you, Nick. Th uh, thank you, David, uh, including for lining up our first question very nicely because uh, Rachel Hewitt has our first question, uh, a former colleague of ours, Happy, and now runs Million Plus. Rachel, your microphone should be on. Yes, hi, good morning. Hi. That, that does line it up nicely. So my question was, um, does the panel think the split of teaching and research aspects of higher education across two government departments decreases or increases government understanding and recognition of universities? And how do they believe it, develop, it impacts the development of higher education policy? Fantastic. Thanks, Rachel. I'm going to take about four questions in a go because we've got a dozen or so questions and I want to get through as many of them as we can. Um, so remember that one. And then the next question is on uh, the TEF from an anonymous uh, person. Um, it says, it would be interesting to hear the panel's interpretation of research and teaching relationship within the TEF criteria SE3, that's student experience three, uh, the provider, which says the provider uses research in relevant disciplines, innovation, scholarship, professional practice, and or employer engagement to contribute to an outstanding academic experience for its students. So it's really a question around where uh, the relationship between teaching and research fit or should fit within the TEF. And the next question is also an anonymous one. And then I'll come to Harriet and then I'll go back to the panel. Uh, the anonymous, uh, second anonymous attendee says, where is the place for third space practitioners 
in the research teaching relationship and how may it be recognized by third space practitioners i mean people uh, who may not teach on formal academic programs but do design manage support the academic and technical aspects of staff and students who experience those programs and they give an example of educational developers learning designers learning technologists librarians student engagement officers and so on so where do they fit in to this and then harriet dunbar morris uh who uh uh is about to move to the university of buckingham to an exciting new role uh asks uh, in fact harriet we can turn on your microphone i think can we hear from you directly i think you can hear from me directly right. so um mine fits actually quite nicely with that tef question i would like to hear from the panel members their views on the terminology that we could use to best define what we mean by the links between research and teaching for our students so uh, when i posed the question we'd heard the phrase research informed um, but other terms such as research based learning and research led teaching are used in the sector and they mean slightly different things. So research based means actually getting the students to undertake the research as opposed to some of the other ones, which mean getting the students to understand about the research that the academics are undertaking. And I just wonder if there's a better phrase we could be using. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. Fantastic. I'm going to go in, I think, in reverse order this time. If, if we can keep the answers as crisp as possible, despite the breadth of the questions, we'll get through uh, some more. So, David, I'm going to come to you first. On the first question about government departments, I would certainly bring higher education back under a single government department. I think it's highly deleterious now to have split it the way it's been split. And I think there's a whole set of arguments in favour of that, which I won't go into. I'll maybe just deal with one of other question about the uh, second question about student experience in the TEF. I think it was a, uh, it is a positive move, of course, that um, the TEF emphasises the importance of research and scholarship in underpinning the educational choices and decisions made by institutions. And indeed, as I said in my remarks, Nick, actually, we mustn't forget that even people who might be described as, quotes teaching only or institutions that might describe themselves as teaching intensive still place a great premium on uh, scholarship and research to underpin educational activity. And maybe sometimes that is forgotten when we think of research intensive as opposed to teaching intensive. In a sense, everything done in universities should be underpinned by the best available research and scholarship. Oh, sorry, my microphone was off. Uh, thank you, David. I'm going to move to Tanzi now. Brilliant. Two questions that uh, pertain to me. The, ter the terminology, Harriet, you asked about that. I think it's quite confusing because of the Jenkins and Healy matrix and the four different terms. It's why I use research informed teaching because it covers all of them, but it's probably muddies the water uh, and people interchangeably use research led and research based, but there were some other terms that Jenkins and Healy use. A lot of um, Russell Group institutions use research rich. Um, and, uh, yeah, but that's another term, but I, I use research informed because I think it covers covers all. And I know it's slightly ambiguous, but I prefer that to nailing down the mask to one of those quadrants in the Jenkins and Healy matrix. In terms of third space practitioners, the other question, just want to say they're vital, absolutely vital to the endeavor of joining up research and teaching, academic developers, learning technologists, librarians, uh, people in, in the third space are the people who can help define what it is, help support academics to deliver on it, um, create a policy and enhancement environment that arrives at a richer understanding of research and for teaching and indeed contribute to uh, curriculum frameworks and assessment that foster this kind of, um, this kind of teaching. So I, I think they are pivotal in this space, in my view. Thank you very much, Martha. Um, yeah, so I think I'm, I'm going to pick one and three if that's okay. So I think firstly, I, I agree with David, um, bringing uh, back together research and teaching or research and the rest of higher education under one department, I think would be pivotal. Um, I think it's very challenging at the moment um, to balance both of those things together, particularly when you potentially have departments that are slightly 
polarizing their views on certain issues and so I think it really needs to be a joined up approach. I think one of the casualties of, of having that kind of siloed way of working in particular is PGRs because they sort of straddle both of the regulators at the moment, they um, are quite a challenge within universities and beyond to try and figure out where they fit best so I think either it's bringing that alignment back together or it's figuring out where those PGRs need to live and giving them one home rather than two. Um, and then on the uh, question about kind of third, um, the uh, the roles of learning participants, that kind of thing within uh, this space, I think they're, they're pivotal. And I, for me, they're kind of the brokers really between some of our researchers and some of our teachers. And, and it's about recognising um, individual areas of expertise and and um, and in information. So, you know, you have researchers who are working on cutting edge ideas and theories and technology that they can be bringing into the classroom, but don't necessarily know how, um, or even that they can do that. Teachers who have uh, probably one of the best uh, views of their curriculum, of their students that they're teaching. Uh, and in the middle, you have um, learning practitioners, I'm thinking broadly, um, who um, really kind of know the art of the possible. And they are the ones who can start to bring that together using you know, research informed practice to, to actually um, develop you know, really meaningful, tangible um, pockets of activity that can start to bridge that gap. And I think there um, isn't enough recognition of that necessarily within universities that there really ought to be. Thank you uh, very much, Martha. I like that broker idea. Um, Nicola. Thanks, Nick. What fantastic questions. Um, I'm going to run through all four, but very briefly. Um, the first one, I can be extremely brief because I think we all agreed that I think the split between departments is really unhelpful and um, is making some of these challenges even worse. And um, you remember that there was a single minister straddling both departments initially. I'm not Sure. I mean, that was very difficult to pull off. And I, 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 I'm not sure that is going to be the solution. I think bringing universities back into the same department is the solution. Um, on the TEF, um, I mean, the way that the TEF reference to um, research is drafted leaves open um, all sorts of uh, different manifestations. And I think when we see the results of the uh, TEF submissions published, it's going to be absolutely fascinating to see how different universities have interpreted that. And I, my suspicion, my, I suspect that there's not going to be a clear division between research intensives and teaching intensives to use that rather crude binary division. I think there's going to be some really imaginative use of uh, limited research function to support teaching. Um, and so I don't think it's necessarily going to be um, uh, simplistic. Uh, and can I just point out the point I make in the booklet that um, despite the REF guidance um, encouraging uh, case studies in terms of impact on students, which seems to be such an important issue, um, that that uh, RAND Europe uh, report uh, from earlier this year uh, suggests that only nine case studies in over 6,000 reference the impact on teaching. I just think that's such a dispiriting statistic we can do better than that third space practitioners absolutely agree with what um martha and tansy and uh, uh, and the questioner says i think they're really important i don't think i can add to that i think the whole question of impact on staffing is something that needs more consideration and then finally on the um vocabulary of research informed teaching i i agree tansy i think it is and harriet i think it, it's not helping that we've got all this different vocabulary but within it you've got situations where um, students are doing their own research and, and that can be captured by research informed teaching but that doesn't necessarily require teaching and research activities both being carried out in the same institution so I think if we're talking at policy level we're talk the vocabulary has got to be slightly different to inquiry-based teaching um, within universities otherwise we're we're really mixing up ap apples and pears there and the danger is that if we have a very generic heading um, be that research informed teaching or whatever it is, um, it can capture institutions that happen to do both teaching and research, but don't bring it together in a meaningful way. Um, and so it can be quite distorting, I think. So I, I, I do think vocabulary is important in an area that we need to look in more detail, as you imply, Harriet, and as Tansy and Martha said. Thank you, Nicola. I'm very struck by the consensus across the panel about uh, government arrangements, because I think uh, in other respects, you've, you've been focusing on somewhat different things from one another, but it's very interesting you're also united on that. So I'm going to do another round of questions. And if we don't get to your question, we will save all the questions and email them to the panel um, so that they're aware of 
uh, what you said and can reflect upon it. But Mike, can we come to you? Mike Ratcliffe of City University. I think you should be on there. Oh, um, I just wanted to ask a, a quick question about um, providers outside the kind of normal understanding. You know, we we you know we talk about research intensive and teaching intensive, but that's still only 120 institutions that are in the TEF, and there were 425 uh, providers. What what can we do to 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 make that uh, a possibility for all of that breadth of providers across? England in this case. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and, and Nicola does uh, refer to that a little bit in her, her paper, as I'm sure you know. Um, John Baker, I'll come to you next. Good morning. I, I was just wondering whether the panel would would, would feel that um, a, a, the exposure of students to subject level research or, or a pedagogical approach, which is informed by research about teaching would have more impact on on learners journeys uh, thank you john and john what's your own institution um london south bank university london south bank great thank you for that question there's a, a, a question here with a named questioner but uh she says she's in a public place so would like the question read out um by leah bladge ward which says uh, with apologies i'm in a public place and can't switch my microphone on but i'm intrigued by the statement nicola made that she is not an academic given that she is now a professor. Uh, I wonder whether she could share insights about the nature uh, um, of the, sorry, my screen keeps moving, about the nature of the professor of practice role in light of new career pathways. And then there's a link to a, a, a related book. Um, and then the fourth question in this round uh, from another anonymous person is I think that there is still a disjoint between research informed teaching and those in scholarship stroke academic development roles being unfairly seen as other in academia. How can those roles help play a role in this? Um, so otherness, um, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you, Martha, first in this round. Oh, there's quite a lot to unpack there, isn't there, Nick? Yes, there is. Don't You don't need to answer all of them. Just pick the ones that particularly focus your mind. Um, I like John's question about which would be more impactful. I think, not to sit on the fence, but I think it needs to be both. I think it's about delivering um, subject level research using good pedagogical practices that we know of, that you know work and we can evaluate going forward with, um, with good research as well. Um, so yeah, I'll come, I might come back later on the other ones if there's, if there's time. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Tansy. Sorry, just unmuting. Uh, I think Martha's answered John's question beautifully. I would just add a, a third way with his question, which is quite a lot of the research our students engage in are interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary or transdisciplinary. And I think there's something quite exciting about that and a lot to be learned from employers or other disciplines. The best example I have at Bristol is of classics and uh, physiology working together on final year dissertations. Um, really exciting. I mean, you can't imagine it. So I think that that's another way students learn from uh, research, but I'd agree with Martha, it's both and. In terms of um, uh, the sort of question around um, Mike's question around the number of provi providers who uh, beyond the 120 or 128 who are doing research and teaching, um, I think there is potentially some virtue in small parts of funding. You said in the chat, should we should we encourage it with small parts of funding? I think there's also some um, some way we network in and partner with some of those institutions. Some of them are FE and HE, and partner more intentionally with them to do projects which cross between. Uh, universities in a city, for example, where some are doing research and teaching and others not. So I, I would say, say some sort of imaginative construction of networks that are citywide, where you get a little bit more partnership may be helpful there. I don't know what you think, Mike. And then the final question, which is the, I suppose, the persistent question around research informed teaching and status and the, the the parity of esteem between the prestige economy of research and the slightly more um, uh, often regarded as peripheral work of, of third space professionals and uh, teachers uh, and teachers on teaching only contracts. I think a lot of gains can be um, made through 
promotions policies, reward systems, but I also think it comes from leadership at the top of institutions. And I think leadership actually putting their hands, uh, you know, putting their hands on the desk and saying that both teaching excellence and research excellence matter and putting their money where their mouth is there is, is really important in my experience. I think um, where you've got leaders who actually back teaching and it permeates the institution, you get some sort of disruption of those peripheral versus prestige narratives. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Sir David now. Just conscious of time, uh, Nick, I'll maybe just pick up the first point from Mike. I mean, I think it's going to be really interesting, as Nicola said, to do a deep dive into all the detailed statements that are going to come back on the uh, from the from the TEF exercise, and maybe there's a piece of happy work to be done uh, to look at that, because I think there's a really interesting question, as uh, Mike's raised, about the extent to which that research-informed or scholarship approach is underpinning teaching across all institutions that have been subject uh, to the TEF. I'm, I don't know enough about those institutions to be able to comment, but I'm sure that many, many colleagues there would say, yes, of course, we do underpin everything that we do, whether it's in a further education college or a small independent provider, and we underpin that with high quality research uh, and scholarship about education, but maybe more work to do on that one, Nick. Yeah, it'll be a fascinating project. Uh, if anyone would like to uh, volunteer to write it up for HEPI, um, we would love to hear from you. Um, Nicola, I'm afraid this is going to be the final word because we will We'll lose our audience after um, 11, but um, I'll say a word at the end about how we might continue this conversation. But Nicola, over to you. Very good. Um, I, I'll be very brief. Um, in terms of Mike's question and uh, the large numbers of providers that don't have research, I think Tanzi's point about ne regional networks and collaborations and partnerships is absolutely crucial. We've got to be more imaginative about setting those up for the benefit it's of students. Um, but at the end of the day, not all providers should do research. Many will be very professionally industry focused. So I'm not necessarily saying that all 425 need to get involved in these sorts of partnerships, but it really does depend on what they do. Um, I, I ought to answer the question about the fact I'm a professor of practice. Um, just to explain, I'm very, I mean, what I, my background is entirely policy and what I bring to the sector I hope is um, an understanding and insights into policy, particularly at national level. And I mentioned that because I think it influences how I approach things and what I do and what I chose to look, chose, choose to look at. Um, so I'm not being sort of self-effacing and uh, irritatingly modest about saying I'm not, not an academic. I'm just reflecting the reality of why I'm doing what I'm doing and how I look at things. Um, and um, the, um, can I just pick up, because I'm really running out of time, Ron Barnett has said we haven't talked about um, the influence of teaching on research. I think that's such an important question. Ron is a real authority on this area and we haven't covered it. It's an important point, but time simply doesn't permit. But worth acknowledging that it does work the other way around. And many researchers um, believe that teaching is incredibly important to their practice. But I think I'd better stop there, Nick, because otherwise we're going to get cut off. Yeah, thank thank you so much, Nicola. Um, um, we could have gone on for another hour. I'm well aware. Um, all the feedback we get on our webinars is that people like them to be short and sweet, which is why we've limited to an hour. But we will capture all these comments and questions that have come in and share them with the panelists. We also Happy is a very small organisation, and we re rely on external authors to a huge degree. So some of the very thought provoking comments in the chat. We would love to continue through our blogs, through other reports, um, and and continue this conversation going because I think as we've proven and our four speakers have proven this morning, there's a lot more life in it yet. Uh, um, and Nicola's report is a brilliant start, as I'm sure Nicola, your follow-up piece about what vice chancellors think will be as well. So I want to end by thanking the University of Bristol for enabling us to put this on. Um, to our, our, our three respondents, uh, uh, Tanzi, Martha and Sir David, to Nicola for uh, writing the report and for being the real catalyst behind all our work on this. Um, and to all of you for giving up an hour to listen in. We've recorded it. We'll make it available on the website later. And do please get in touch, as I say, if you'd like to continue this conversation through HEPI and our other, our other channels. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.